So I'm going to start my sermon this morning with a little kind of like introduction to Unitarian Universalism, a little UU 101. I'm going to talk with you a little bit about the Unitarian Universalist Seven Principles. And if you aren't sure what I'm talking about here, or if you'd like to just kind of play along in your pews, um, you can you can open up your hymnal and turn one, two, three, four, five, six pages in, and you get to a, like there's a there's a statement for us of the of the seven principles there and. If you want to, if you want to play along, it's the page that begins, "We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote all in big, all capital letters." And the the document you're looking at on this on this page uh, contains a couple of parts. First, the top the top kind of paragraph are the are the seven principles running from the inherent worth and dignity of every person down to respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. After that comes uh, the sources, and depending on which edition of the hymnal you have, you'll either have five or six of them. So we can go down, if you go down to that, to the very last kind of one on the, the sources, how many of the, have as the last one humanist teachings that counsel us? Look at that, that many. And how many of you have something else? How many of you have spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions? So we get some difference here. And what they didn't tell you, when they, when they did different editions of the hymnal, they also changed the words to one of the hymns. And so if you try to sing it, you get half the people singing one word <laughs> and half the people singing the other word. Um, and if I'm ever feeling devious on a Sunday morning, I'll, I'll have us sing that hymn, and it'll be awkward. So, and then at the op- on the opposite page, down at the very, very bottom, it says that this statement was adopted as a bylaw by the 1984, 1985, and for some of you, end 1995 General Assemblies, which, yes, it reveals, I am having you read as a religious text this morning, the Unitarian Universalist Association bylaws. Um, I hope I haven't bored you yet. And by the way, there is a rule here. This is it's very interesting. There's a rule that says that, that this statement, the, the principles and the, and the sources, will be reviewed and changed every 15 years. So, so this isn't even like, you know, I, I, I memorized these when I was, when I was younger, and, and now they might come along and change them. I guess we're a people who are very, very comfortable with change. There's actually... Among Unitarian Universalist leaders, some of them, kind of a backlash against the seven principles. One acerbic minister took to calling them the seven banalities or the seven dwarfs. And another wryly claims that there's hardly a library association or a rotary club in our country that wouldn't fully embrace Unitarian Universalism. These critics, I think, react to it for several reasons. There's a, there's a sense that the, the principles are kind of devoid of religious or theological language and lack poetry. Um, and, and then there's the reality that, for the most part, we Unitarian Universalists really love to criticize ourselves, which can either be a sign of healthy humility or unhealthy low self-esteem. I'll let you choose. But I actually don't count myself in the company of those who are overly critical of the seven principles. I actually like them quite a bit. And I like them because even though at first they seem sort of deceptively simple, like nobody would possibly disagree with that, it's actually when you dig a little bit deeper that I find them kind of philosophically complex and like they put challenges before us. What I want to point out is that some of these principles that seem so non-controversial and inoffensive and bland actually have a measure of philosophical complexity to them. Take the fourth principle, which talks about us practicing a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And do, do freedom and responsibility ever seem at odds with each other? That's, that's what parents and teenagers fight about, right? Right? One says, I want to be free, and the other says, I want you to be responsible. You know, that's why universities have for, for research that involves human subjects. There is a whole bunch of hoops and policies and reviews to jump through so that we can try to find that, that 
correct place between both freedom and responsibility. Or take the fifth principle, which exalts both the use of the democratic process and an individual's rights of conscience. There's that tension between what the group decides and an individual's conscientious unwillingness to go along with the will of the majority. It's like we practice democracy except when we don't want to. There's a tension there. But this morning, I want to talk with you. My sermon is really about the third principle. The third principle says that we are supposed to practice, quote, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. Does anybody see a tension between acceptance and encouragement to grow or change? The title of my sermon this morning, by the way, is my best attempt to rephrase the third principle in a way that kind of shows that tension. The title I've chosen is, I love you exactly the way you are, now change. So let me ask some abstract questions here. What is the nature of acceptance? Is it possible to simultaneously accept something and desire that it change? Is encouraging someone to change a form of non-acceptance? To what degree is there a tension between acceptance and encouragement to change or to grow? And so let me ask you, put it anew, you have come to, who've come to this church for the, for the first time or the 500th time, let me ask you have, you, have you come here to be accepted as you are? Or have you come here hoping to be encouraged to grow and change in some way? As the parent of a young child, I'm well-versed in that tension between acceptance and encouragement. Lydia is going to turn two next week, and, and I accept that a child her age will throw food at the table and will throw tantrums and will wreak havoc with magic markers. And, and at the same time, I don't accept it when she throws food. I kind of encourage her not to do that. We're about to start toilet training in our house, and this is this moment where kind of, you know, I, I accept changing diapers right now, but, but I'm certainly going to be encouraging some spiritual growth and development in our household. <laughs> in parenting, there's this, there's this tension between acceptance and encouragement. The tension between the two is seen in other places as well. I'm I'm friends with a number of professors, and last month, right before the start of the school year, a number of them got themselves pumped up for the coming school year by passing around amongst themselves an article entitled, No, You Are Not Entitled to Your Opinion. And this is, this is what the professor of philosophy writes. Every year, he says, I, I try to do at least two things with my students, at least once, First, I make a point of addressing them as philosophers. A bit cheesy, but hopefully it encourages active learning. Secondly, I say something like this. I'm sure you've heard the expression, everyone is entitled to their opinion. Perhaps you've even said it yourself, maybe to head off an argument or to bring one to a close. Well, as soon as you walk into this room, it's no longer true. You are not entitled to your opinion. You're only entitled to what you can defend and argue for. The problem with saying I'm entitled to my opinion is that all too often it's used to shelter beliefs that should have been abandoned. It becomes shorthand for I can say or think whatever I like. And by extension, it implies that continuing to argue is somehow disrespectful. And we recognize in kind of in in the classroom that this is basically true, right? That, That education is a process of development and formation and encouragement to grow. Ideally, you want to be stretched and challenged, and it doesn't serve the purpose of learning for the person to say, accept me as I am, I'm entitled to my opinion. That kind of shuts down the whole learning enterprise. I was reminded of this fact uh, Thursday when, when Marion and I went together to a meeting of the UU campus ministry at UNC, and I was talking with one of the UU students about a class that she was taking this semester on uh, introduction to the Hebrew Bible. And uh, she was telling me about how a lot of students in that class are being exposed to understandings of that text that are kind of way, way out of their comfort zone and very different 
from how they had been taught to think. And I think, I think that's, that's education, right? There's supposed to be. Ideally, there is this cataclysmic disruption that takes place. So is, is a church like an educational institution? Where do we fall? Where do we fall on this spectrum of acceptance and encouragement to change? I was contemplating religious literature that evokes this tension when a friend of mine suggested that I take a look at the book of Job from the Hebrew Bible as a story that contains these themes. If you're not familiar with the book of Job, let me summarize it. Job is a righteous soul whose life is, is successful. He has a loving family and property and wealth. He works hard, plays by the rules, and loves God. And in the book, God and Satan make a wager to see whether Job's love of God will endure if his, if his life is turned upside down and becomes one of pain and suffering. So God causes Job to lose his family, his crops shrivel, his animals die from disease, and to pile on, Job is afflicted with um, agonizing diseases. And it turns out that Job turns. He curses God, demands an explanation. And at this point in the story, Job's three friends show up. And the friends, when they show up, they aren't exactly accepting or comforting. Rather, the three friends, the three friends say, Job, are, are you sure you didn't do something to deserve this? Think, think really hard. You probably did something to deserve this. Or you should probably just admit that you did something to deserve this. The friends, you know, with, with friends like that. And then next in the story, God appears and confronts Job. And Job demands. Job demands an explanation from God. And God responds by saying, I'm God. I do what I please. And Job gives in. Job says, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry to have questioned you. This is a challenging story. In reading it, I want, I want Job's friends to meet him with acceptance, not kind of something else. And in fact, in facing God, I, I, want, I want Job not to give in. I want Job to hold the line. I want, I want Job to continue to resist, to hold on to that sense of rightness. Acceptance or encouragement to change and grow, can these exist or are they in tension? I think of Martin Luther King in, in his ministry urging people to claim and occupy that space of discomfort and challenge and change. King spoke of reaching a state of being fundamentally maladjusted, that we should walk around in this world feeling maladjusted. He said, we must always maintain a kind of divine discontent. So which is it? Acceptance of each other or encouragement to change and grow? Or it has to be both, right? But that's not the most satisfying answer. And, well, who are we to say that the answer should be satisfying either? What I want us to do... What I'm trying to kind of get across here is that, is that the, the principles do contain this kind of tension for us in our living and tension that, that we might actually embody, that we probably do embody in our families, at our jobs, in our classes, whether it's introduction to the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, or, or whether it's a different class, sometimes in church. And so what I want to do is kind of not only point out that this tension exists, but I want us to kind of hold it, to kind of feel it. And so what I've done is I've selected two readings. One reading is the most pure articulation of acceptance that I have ever found. It's in, it's in your order of service. It's the unison reading. It's uh, words by Libby Roderick. Um, it's words that I grew up singing uh, in Unitarian Universalist high school conferences. It's words that when I sang them made me feel 
as accepted as I'd ever felt in my life. And what I did is I chose a reading. Um, it's a reading by Annie Dillard, and it, it expresses discontent and challenge uh, better than any. And so what, what I want to do is I want us to hold this tension. I'm going to read the Annie Dillard, and then I'm going to invite you to respond with the Libby Roderick. Dillard writes, Why do people in church seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a package tour of the absolute? Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to pass a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may awake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us in to a place we do not know and may never return from. And the congregation responds, So which one is it? Which one did you come here for? Or is it somehow, paradoxically, both? Amen.